So there's a little bit of terminology that I would like to introduce you to as we jump into this section on the neurobiology of food intake. So the first term is satiety. Satiety is the feeling of fullness, feeling satiated. Another way to think about satiety is that it is the suppression of hunger after a meal. So after you've eaten a meal, after you've eaten some food, you will feel satiated, satiety. Um, we also have the term orexigenic. Orexigenic means that you, um, this is inspiring the increase of food intake. So it's gonna inspire you to eat. Orexigenic, increasing food intake. Then the opposite of orexigenic is anorexigenic. Anorexigenic is gonna be meaning that you are decreasing food intake. So anorexigenic and satiety, these two terms kind of go together. When you're getting an anorexic, uh, anorexigenic signal, that is going to be stimulating satiety, stimulating a feeling of fullness, inhibiting further food intake. And then finally, homeostasis. This is a term that we are probably already familiar with, um, but homeostasis is referring to a dynamic balance, that the environment is causing changes, but we have feedback loops that maintain our body in a balance, and it's a dynamic balance due to a changing environment. So we have previously talked about homeostasis in terms of blood glucose concentration. We know that our body wants to maintain a specific certain concentration of blood glucose and that when our body goes into hyperglycemia, when our blood glucose concentration increases, that's when we're gonna start secreting insulin so we can decrease the blood glucose concentration or when our blood glucose goes hypoglycemic, when our blood glucose concentration decreases, we're gonna sec uh, secrete the hormone glucagon to help increase the concentration of glucose in the blood. So that's glucose homeostasis. In this case, we're gonna be focused on homeostasis in regards to energy balance. Um, and uh, we're gonna learn about all the different ways in which the peripheral tissues signal to the brain to help maintain energy balance homeostasis. And so we'll also use the term homeostatic eating, which is gonna be the regulation of food intake to maintain energy balance homeostasis. Okay, so let's dig in a little bit more into the hypothalamus. So I mentioned that there are gonna be two nuclei that we're gonna focus on within the hypothalamus. The first nuclei we're gonna focus on is down here, the arcuate nucleus. So I, am, I drew the arcuate nucleus in this pale yellow color. Within the arcuate nucleus, there are two subnuclei. They go by, um, they, so these two different subnuclei are different clusters of neurons. This first one are called the palm C neurons. I've uh, represented them in a light purple. Palm C stands for pre pro melanocortin producing neurons. So, kind of a long name, palm C neurons. And these palm C neurons, they are neurons that are going to secrete the neurotransmitter alpha MSH. So that's clus oops. cluster one are the POMC neurons. They secrete the neurotransmitter alpha MSH. The second cluster or nucleus of neurons within the arcuate nucleus are called the AG, AGRP neurons. AGRP stands for agouti-related peptide. So that's these guys over here. And these AGRP neurons, they, they will um, produce a different neurotransmitter called neuropeptide Y, abbreviated as NPY. So, so far within the arcuate nucleus, we have two different clusters of neurons. The first cluster are the POMC neurons, which use the neurotransmitter alpha MSH. And then the other cluster are the agouti-related peptide neurons, and they will use the neurotransmitter NPY. And then the other um, nucleus that we're gonna talk about within the hypothalamus is called the paraventricular hypothalamus up here. And we're gonna abbreviate the paraventricular hypothalamus as PVH, and it's in this darker yellow color up here. Now, when neurons in the paraventricular hypothalamus are stimulated, they are going to inhibit food intake. So stimulation of the paraventricular hypothalamus neurons stimulates satiety. Remember again, satiety is gonna be the suppression of hunger, the suppression of food intake. So stimulating the PVH is going to inhibit food intake. So let's take another step to learn about how these different nuclei communicate with each other.
So on the, ne the neurons in the paraventricular hypothalamus, they have a receptor called the melanocortin-4 receptor. I'm going to abbreviate melanocortin-4 receptor as MC4R and representing it in this kind of brownish yellow kind of gross color. MC4R, melanocortin-4 receptor. So the neurons in the paraventricular hypothalamus have this MC4R receptor. When the PV8, when this MC4R receptor is stimulated, that causes the paraventricular hypothalamus to inhibit food intake. So the neurons that make up clusters within the arcuate nucleus, they are going to interact with the, para, with the MC4R receptor to determine whether or not the paraventricular hypothalamus is going to be stimulated or not. So first let's look at what happens with the POMC neurons. So the POMC neurons, remember that they are going to use the neurotransmitter alpha MSH. When POMC neurons um, release alpha MSH, that will, cause, that will bind to the MC4R receptor to stimulate the paraventricular hypothalamus. When the, para, when the neurons of the paraventricular hypothalamus are stimulated, that is going to inhibit food intake. So you can think of it this way. The POMC neurons are going to inhibit food intake. That, so thinking back to some of the terminology that we were introduced to before, that means that these POMC neurons are anorexigenic because they are reducing food intake. So POMC neurons will secrete the uh, and the neurotransmitter alpha MSH. Alpha MSH is going to bind to this MC4R receptor on the neurons of the paraventricular hypothalamus that will cause the paraventricular hypothalamus to be stimulated to ultimately inhibit food intake. So that's one side of the, hypo of the um, stimulation coming from the arcuate nucleus down here. The other subnuclei within the arcuate nucleus, of course, are these AGRP neurons. Remember that the AGRP neurons, they're going to use a different neurotransmitter called NPY. When the AGRP neurons secrete NPY, that NPY is also going to bind to the MC4R receptor on the paraventricular hypothalamus, except in this case, NPY is going to inhibit this MC4R receptor. So when NPY inhibits the MC4R receptor, that is going to inhibit um, and suppress the neurons in the paraventricular hypothalamus, so we will no longer have this inhibition of food intake. So we could say that the AGRP neurons, in this case, are orexigenic because they're going to actually increase food intake. Um, since the AGRP neurons are inhibiting the paraventricular hypothalamus and therefore we're no longer getting this inhibition of food intake. So AGRP neurons are orexigenic, increasing food intake. The other thing that the AGRP neurons will do is they will send NPY neurotransmitter to inhibit the POMC neurons. So not only do the AGRP neurons inhibit the paraventricular hypothalamus, they also inhibit the POMC neurons to make sure that there is no positive stimulation coming from the POMC neurons towards the paraventricular hypothalamus. So taking all of this together, we, know, we now know that stimulation of the paraventricular hypothalamus through this MC4R receptor causes inhibition of food intake. The POMC neurons will secrete the, the neurotransmitter alpha MSH, which can stimulate the MC4R receptor to stimulate the paraventricular hypothalamus and inhibit food intake. Those are the anorexigenic neurons, whereas the AGRP neurons, they are going to secrete the neurotransmitter NPY. NPY is going to inhibit this MC4R receptor in, and therefore inhibit the paraventricular hypothalamus, so we will no longer be getting this inhibition of food intake. In fact, we will get an increase in food intake. Um, that makes these AGRP neurons orexigenic. And then the other level of regulation here too is that the AGRP neurons will inhibit these POMC neurons with NPY. Now the other piece that I want to let you know about the hypothalamus that makes it extra special is that the hypothalamus actually has some access to 
the factors that are circulating around in the blood. Now, most of the brain is covered by a blood-brain barrier. It's a very um, non-penetrant layer that separates the blood from the brain, and this is really important for many reasons. It helps them prevent infections from getting into the brain and, and all of this. Now, what that means, though, is other circulating factors like hormones can't access the brain. However, the blood-brain barrier is a little bit leaky around this region down here, right around where we have the pituitary gland and the, and the lower portion of the hypothalamus. So since we have this leaky blood-brain barrier here, that means that some hormones can get into this part of the hypothalamus and actually bind to neurons within the arcuate nucleus. So this part of the hypothalamus has a leaky blood-brain barrier. And just as an aside, one of my favorite words in anatomy is the infundibulum. That's this little stalk right here that attaches the pituitary gland to the hypothalamus. So a little bit of trivia for you there. The infundibulum is a stalk attaching the pituitary gland to the hypothalamus.